is questions to the Minister for Finance. Question number one has been withdrawn and questions five and nine have been grouped. So the first person I have to call is Mr Gordon Dunn. Question number two, Mr Principal Deputy Speaker. I am very aware that the local newspaper sector here is struggling to survive given the significant loss of income experienced over recent months. I can confirm to the member that back in June I did indeed put plans to executive colleagues to extend the 12-month rate support to the local newspaper industry here. That was in line with similar relief that had been provided in Scotland. I remain keen in seeing that this matter is agreed by the executive. In response to representations from the local newspaper sector, I am also seeking an increase in the executive's advertising uh, in this area. Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, and thank the Minister for his answers and his efforts to date. And I think we welcome the Minister's support for the newspaper sector. They do provide a key role within our local communities, and it is vital that they do get support, especially in relation to the rates. And just I would re emphasise, I would encourage the Minister. To, to do what he can to encourage public sector uh, advertising uh, for the newspaper in, uh, agencies and especially increasing the public health awareness um, issues that need to be at, at this time need to be highlighted. Minister. Yes, I, well, I agree with the member, and that's why I did uh, put forward a proposition, as I said, to the executive in June. It, it hasn't received support as yet. Uh, I'm still hopeful in relation to that. Uh, and I did, uh, after meeting with a cross-sectoral group of the local newspaper industry, uh, engage then with Executive Information Service in relation to their advertising campaign, which uh, it seems to me not that much of a trickle down to the local newspaper sector, uh, and of course they are a vital, uh, they are vital in terms of business, but also in terms of community life in the, in the areas that they cover, and they also will hit, I think, a demographic in terms of advertising that perhaps social media and, and electronic media don't hit, uh, and perhaps some of the people who, who most need to hear in terms of protecting themselves and, and whatever vulnerabilities they might have. So uh, I'm keen that, uh, that that such an advertising campaign has stepped up. And it, as has been done in Scotland, that it's targeted through local newspapers so that we can get uh, to that demographic that perhaps isn't getting through the social media side. Mr. Mike Nesbitt. Mr. Deputy Speaker, thank you, and I thank the Minister for his words of, of support. There is another action within this gift he could take which would bring long term benefit uh, to local media, and that is supporting libel reform. He will recall that uh, as Finance Minister Sammy Wilson not only brought, did not bring forward an LCM on the 2013 Defamation, Defamation Act, he did not even consult uh, with executive colleagues. Well, can I say I am happy to look at that. It is not something that has been brought to my attention since I came in. Obviously, we were very quickly into dealing with COVID and all of the issues that thro has thrown up, but I am happy to go back into the department and see where that issue has, has been sitting uh, and what can be done in relation to it. Claire Sugden. Well, Deputy Speaker, um, given the new restrictions and the challenges that are presenting themselves, is the Minister considering any other sectors to which he may extend the 12-month rate relief scheme? Well, I have not had specific uh, requests from, from others. Uh, and, and the, the work that we did uh, to identify those sectors was done by the uh, University of Ulster, uh, their economic team, there, and they came forward with the sectors that they identified would be most in need. Uh, and, and, and we obviously targeted rate support for that. They have since recognised and looked again at the newspaper sector and said, you know, given the, the drop off in entertainment, which is obviously a big source of income in terms of advertising for local press, uh, that they had been particularly hit and they, they um, advocated that they would be supported in that way. So if there are other particular sectors that feel that that is the case, I, I'm, I'm more than happy to look at them. But as I say, it was based on a piece of research work that we undertook and that identified the particular sectors. Mr. Matthew Toole. Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. Um, I've engaged with the Minister on this in the past, it's something I've been uh, campaigning on. He said that a bid had gone into the uh, executive in relation to extending relief for local newspapers. Can he be specific? Is there an outstanding bid, and have ministers in the executive not agreed to it, or is it just that it's waiting for a, a sort of future bids process? Where, where exactly is it? Well, it, it, uh, we did quantify what the cost would be uh, in terms of rates uh, holiday for that sector for the rest of the financial year. You will know that, that quite a lot of the local newspapers have a kind of a shop front part to them, uh, some of them who have their own 
uh, printing facilities uh, would qualify under uh, manufacturing rate relief, uh, and so they, it isn't necessary for those. So we did quantify that. It hasn't got onto the executive agenda. That's a matter of regret, and I hope that it will at some stage very soon. Mr. John Blair. Three, Principal Deputy Speaker. I secured executive agreement to a package of time-limited support measures for the aviation sector in April 2020, as the lockdown resulted in significant reductions in passenger numbers. This package was developed in conjunction with the economy and infrastructure ministers who have policy responsibility for aviation. This package provides up to £5.7 million for Belfast City Airport, City of Derry Airport, and those airlines operating essential flights and help keep the air bridge open with Britain. In May, I also announced 100% rate relief for Belfast International, Belfast City and City of Derry airports until the 31st of March 2021. That additional package is worth £2.2 .2 million. In June, the Executive agreed to further support the airports given the material losses they are suffering, including continuing to support City of Derry until March 2021. My department is actively considering what further support might be required to maintain local connectivity, and I understand the other departments are doing the same. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. Thank the Minister for that answer. Can I ask in addition to that in relation to help uh, available to the, the aviation sector, the airports, and particularly Belfast International in my own constituency, can the Minister detail any discussions he has had with Treasury regarding the uh, possible removal of domestic air passenger duty? No, that hasn't uh, arisen in our discussions with Treasury. We have focused, as he, he would understand, in relation to some of the schemes that Treasury offered, including the job retention scheme and, and the job support scheme that's going to replace it, and also some of the loans issues. But we're, we are continuing the discussion, and we've had quite a lot of dialogue with all three airports, uh, both collectively and individually, over the, the past while. We're ascertaining what the key issues for them, where the key costs lie for them, uh, including Belfast International, uh, and we will attempt to put together further support for them based on their, their needs and, and requirements at this time. Dr. Steve Aiken. Uh, thank you very much indeed, uh, Mr. Deputy Principal Speaker. And may I thank the Minister for his remarks so far. Uh, in particular, for Belfast International Airport, we have a real situation where it looks as if the airport is no longer to be able to continue to do 24-hour operations. And I'm afraid the Economy Department has been rather laggardly in putting forward bids for support for this. Can I ask the Minister whether he could encourage his own department, who seem to be more capable of getting money for the airlines and airports, if he could look at this and endeavour fairly quickly to make sure that we have at least one aviation facility in Northern Ireland that is fully capable of 24 hours operations? Well, as I say, we, we have a very uh, regular and ongoing uh, dialogue and have, a had, have had since the start of the pandemic with the airports because we recognise very clearly they are key. Uh, in terms of, of uh, connectivity, which is key in terms of our local economy, all three airports. Uh, and yes, we're happy to continue the dialogue with Belfast International. If there are particular issues which affect the timing of its flights, it's something probably beyond the scope of our department. Uh, but we have acted, if you, as, as, if you like, as a, as a kind of conduit with other departments as well in, in understanding what the immediate requirements of there are. In talking to the Department for Transport uh, in London uh, in relation to our airports as well as talking to Treasury, but making sure that the local departments also are responding to their needs. Mr. Gordon Dom. Deputy Speaker, can the Minister give us some assurance in relation to uh, manufacturing, especially Bombardier, and the impact of the, the drop-off in aircraft flights, and the loss that there was, the risk of the loss of a number of jobs in manufacturing to Bombardier and other uh, suppliers within the supply chain who worked tirelessly, tirelessly for uh, manufacturing in Northern Ireland. Well, I, can I say that uh, I mean, it would primarily be up to his colleague, the Minister for the Economy, to bring forward some propositions and to engage with those sectors to understand what their losses may be. And I, I do understand, and the Minister has mentioned on a number of occasions, about the avi broader aviation and aviation support industry being very much challenged uh, in the time ahead because orders will drop off and it will be much longer. Uh, come back for them than perhaps some other sectors which will, might be able to respond more quickly. Uh, but I'm more than happy to hear from departments in relation to where they think the critical issues are that need to be addressed. Of course, they have to quantify that in terms of a bid, and then I, I'm happy to, to an, analyse that to, to, to do some, uh, some due diligence on it and present that to the executive for support. Mr. Andrew Muir. In the current 2021 rating year, 
I am pleased that over 25,000 businesses are currently benefiting from the targeted 12 months rate relief or holiday introduced to help those businesses particularly impacted by COVID-19. This initiative, which is providing £213 million of rate support, is acknowledged by local businesses to be absolutely essential. This targeted support, of course, builds on the £100 million support provided in the earlier four months of a rates holiday provided to all businesses and demonstrates our continued determination to help businesses get through this pandemic. You will have heard my response to the member for North Down concerning the newspaper sector, and I consider this would be a small but suitable extension to the scheme. Thank you very much, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his response. The assistance given in this financial year is to be welcomed, and should I believe be also extended to cover those industries affected by the further restrictions now in place. Uh, can I ask the Minister what work is being done to look at uh, relief for the next financial year, which is 2021 uh, 22? Because I know that a number of businesses will continue to suffer a downturn in trade as a result of the pandemic. Well, I agree, I agree with him on his last point that the, it's unlikely that we will be through the economic consequences of this pandemic, whatever but the health consequences by the end of the financial year. Uh, and we all sincerely hope that there will be some end uh, to the pandemic and some uh, solutions found to that. But uh, undoubtedly, economic damage is going to continue on. We've already begun the exercise of looking at next year's rates in, in relation to commercial, non-domestic. Uh, and we will begin engaging with some of the business sectors in relation to that. The, the piece of work that we undertook to, if you like, target more rate support uh, beyond the first four months, which, which uh, benefited all businesses, was undertaken by the University of Ulster, and we have asked him again to give us some assistance in looking forward to next year. Uh, it's very difficult, as he will understand, given how unpredictable the virus has been and the, the consequence of, of further restrictions having to be introduced. But uh, we are undertaking that work, and we will engage again University of Ulster to assist us in looking at those specific sectors that are going to continue to struggle in the new financial year. Mr. Tim Allister. I asked the Minister to look at one particular sector in business which has not been provided for in rates relief, namely the B&B &B sector, because they primarily pay domestic rates, and yet they seek to operate businesses which have been devastated. Uh, would it not be fair and appropriate in that niche to provide uh, rates relief for B&B &B operators? Well, I, I, I'm certainly content to look at the issue of rates relief. It, it is timely because in our consideration of the scheme to support businesses who are forced uh, to clo into closure, we have been able to include those uh, smaller bed and breakfasts in this scheme. Uh, and it was simply on the basis of a conversation with them where, as he quite rightly identifies, they come in under the domestic rating and therefore LPS were unable to distinguish between them and ordinary households. Uh, but they advised us that the tourist board gives them a certificate of accreditation. So it was simply a matter of getting the list. And that could have been done earlier this year in the, in the pandemic. And I regret it wasn't because we could have got to support that sector much e more easily. And so we have now been able to include them in the support package for businesses which are, are now being uh, uh, obliged to close down under the new restrictions. So that's something. Uh, it's not the rates relief question he raises. Uh, but I think it does point out the necessity not just of departments to collaborate together, but arm's length bodies to bring information in to assist. And, and I've asked departments to adopt a can-do attitude, and the same applies to arm's length bodies, where a sector such as that, which is, is vital, I think there's some 400 businesses affected, uh, which is vital to tourism uh, industry here, should have been picked up earlier in the year, but I'm glad it has been picked up now. Ms. Gemma Dolan. Concolia. Minister, do you agree that the business rate policy for the next financial year needs to be set as soon as possible to give businesses time to plan? Yes, I, I think it, 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 sh it should be. Uh, of course, we, we have budgetary issues which we have to get uh, clarity on, uh, and we're pressing very hard to get those, uh, because in setting policies, we want to set them against the budgets that are available to us, and we're, we are intending and planning on the basis that we're into a three year multi-annual budget for resource and a four year for capital. We have yet to get absolute confirmation from Treasury in relation to that. The spending review has begun uh, and both not just ourselves but Scotland and Wales are very keen to get some uh, information from Treasury in relation to how that's been conducted. So of course I agree with you that the planning uh, should be done as early as possible but when we are uncertain about the funding envelope that we have it makes it much more difficult to plan. Mr Pat Catney. Principal, Deputy Speaker, and thank you, Minister, for your answers so far. Um, Minister, um, 
Has con- are no considerations been given to extending targeted rates relief to the local sectors like the creative and in the arts, you know, the, the arts sector? Um, does the minister agree with me that it is um, irresponsible to continue to rely solely upon the ad hoc handouts from Westminster uh, to address the structural challenges to Northern Ireland's economy thrown up by COVID? And what discussions has he had with the Minister for the Economy around developing an economic intervention programme to address the long-term impacts of jobs and business creation? Well, such, I mean, the executive has discussed obviously the, the, the broader issue of economic support, and I have had discussions with the Minister for the Economy as well in relation to meeting support in the here and now. Uh, the difficulty, as I've just identified in my last answer, uh, in terms of a longer term economic uh, input and, and providing longer term support, and this is, is going to be a protracted economic recovery, uh, undoubtedly, is no one the front and envelope that we had for the years ahead. Uh, and that's why we need some certainty from the a comprehensive spent review process that's ongoing in Whitehall uh, and find out, as I say, both the, the time frame that we're operating in and also the sum that we have attached to that. And I think that then allows us, that's not to say we shouldn't be engaging with the business sectors, we shouldn't be formulating plans, but to put something very concrete in place requires you to know the time frame of the budget and the funding envelope that you have. Mrs. Pam Cameron. Question number five, please. With your permission, I'll ask Concorda, I want you to group question five and question nine. Uh, the executive agreed a support scheme for businesses in Derry City and Straban Council area directly affected by, the health, affected by the health regulations announced on the 1st of October. Following the executive receiving an additional £200 million, I moved swiftly to double the payments previously announced for Derry and Straban Council area and extend the support package to those eligible businesses that are subject to the new restrictions uh, all across the council, all council areas from Friday evening. As Finance Minister, I want to use the levers at my disposal to make a difference quickly, and this £35 million scheme enables us to put payments promptly in place. We estimate that around 430 eligible businesses in Derry and Strabane may benefit from that support. Applications opened last Wednesday, and as of this morning, I think there were in around 400 applications. I call Ms Cameron. Thank you, Mr President, Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his answers so far. Um, Obviously, uh, Minister, the, you know, your response, uh, it's a very fast-moving situation and, and we've already also preceded the question, um, but has the Minister made any assessment of the budgetary needs, particularly for the Department of Economy, should current four-week restrictions on many businesses sectors be extended further or in a more localised context? Well, the, the Department, I had a conversation prior to Thursday's uh, executive meeting with the Minister for Economy. Uh, uh, and uh, clearly the scheme that I have outlined there picks up those businesses that are forced to close who have a rateable premises. Uh, and that's probably most of them, but not, certainly not all of them. There, uh, there will be many people, particularly in that uh, close contact services, who operate from their own homes, who travel to, to, to provide services to people uh, who maybe hire a chair in, a, in another person's premises. Uh, and so uh, I spoke to the economy minister about quickly uh, coming on the back of the scheme we had, which uh, we were able to do quickly because of the LPS data, uh, because it had been tried and tested on the, the 10K and 25K schemes earlier in the year, uh, to get that on the ground. And it was, it was essential, uh, because this is a four-week uh, intervention, to get that money very, very quickly out in, in terms of support to people. Uh, and so I'm hoping that, that uh, further schemes are developed. I know the economy minister told the executive on Thursday that she intended to bring some schemes forward to the executive early this week. Uh, and so I look forward to seeing those. Obviously, they'll come to my own department for uh, some assessment. And then I would hope that we're in a position in this Thursday executive to have an understanding of what that amounts to, uh, and of course, to try and get support to those people as quickly as possible. Ms. Karen Mullen. Pre last can call your Minister, thank you for acting early to provide the support to businesses in Derry and Straban and continuing on with that process. Minister, can I ask when those businesses will receive the portion or owed on the higher payment? Yes, the, uh, the, the scheme, as I say there, the scheme for Derry City and Straban, we, we moved ahead with because they had already at that stage, even though we knew further uh, interventions were coming, already at that stage they had been closed for over a week. 
So it was important to move ahead as quickly as possible with that scheme. Uh, that, that the scheme for all 11 council areas has been open this morning, and I understand that there are uh, several thousand applications already in for that. Uh, and what we will do when the regulations are, are very uh, through clearly in relation to the level of payment, uh, because the rest of the regulations are in place, then we will add on to the payment already received uh, on some of the Derry City and Strabane uh, businesses and make sure that they get the same amount as everyone else as quickly as possible. Dr. Kiva Archibald. Uh, good to approve last can call you, um, and I want to thank the Minister for his responses so far and commend him on getting the finance package in place and open today. Um, Minister, when the North West package was announced, the SDLP leader claimed that Nicola Mallon was critical of the package made available. Is the Minister aware of any such representation or criticism from the Infrastructure Minister? Good. Well, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm loath to get into internal exactly. Suffice to say that uh, when that scheme was put in place, we did uh, obviously uh, circulate the scheme to all executive colleagues uh, for comment uh, before it was brought to the executive, and we received no objections uh, to the scheme at all. Mr. Roy Beggs. Question number six. Uh, the, the budget for 2021 was actually published on 31st of March this year. Uh, however, if the member is referring to the 2021-22 budget, then this cannot be published without the understanding of the overall financial context. In that regard, the executive's funding envelope is yet to be determined. The funding envelopes depend on the outcome of the Treasury spending review, and the Chancellor has not yet set a date for the, out for the spending review outcome. That's something myself and the other devolved administration colleagues have been pressing him for. And once we know the outcome of the spent review, a local budget process will follow, and the executive must have a budget in place for 2021-22 before the new financial year. I welcome the publication of the main estimates in the last few weeks. It's important to have detailed estimates for planning purposes. But does the minister appreciate the importance of having a draft budget public, published and engaging with the public uh, going forward? And will he assure me? that we will have one this time and he will not become the second Sinn Féin Minister to fail to publish a draft budget. Well, the member will know that I could only publish a budget when I know the, the, the amount that will be there and also the time frame within which we're planning. So uh, the earlier we can get that information from the comprehensive spent review was to, due to have taken place over the summer months in Whitehall. It's now pushed back into the autumn. We're pressing for the earliest uh, information possible, and, and both myself and the Scottish Finance Minister and the Welsh Finance Minister have been jointly pressing for this because the, the lack of uh, information in relation to that affects all of our planning. Uh, and so I can assure him that as soon as we have uh, sufficient information to allow us, uh, we, will, we will engage in the budget planning process immediately and make sure there is full consultation with uh, both this Assembly and its committees, but also with other sectors who will have an interest. Ms. Martina Anderson. Minister, are you planning a multi year budget? I'm thinking primarily about infrastructure. I'm on the Infrastructure Committee, and it would be quite useful and helpful for the North West, particularly Derry. Well, w once we know that, I'm, I'm intent to have uh, a series of discussions with other executive colleagues, uh, each individually in terms of their own budgetary requirements. Uh, and I, that it's necessary to do that, but uh, we're also doing it, if you like, with one eye blind because we don't know the amount that we're going to have. Uh, but it will be up for the Minister for Infrastructure to bring forward proposals uh, for spending within whatever time frame we understand that we have to bring forward proposals. And of course, uh, I look forward to receiving them from her, including ones for the North West as well. Mr Matthew O'Toole. Principal, Deputy Speaker. Uh, Minister, the budget that was published in uh, June of this year was basically a placeholder in part because of the COVID crisis. We are now 10 months from the restart of these institutions, but we are about 18 months from the end of this mandate and new elections. We are also, uh, we're also in the midst of the COVID crisis, which probably won't be over for at least six months, even in the most optimistic timeline. Would he accept, would he agree with me, that it is basically now extremely unlikely that there will be a full multi-year budget, a programme for government, or anything approaching a serious strategic um, budgeting process for this executive? And further to that, he really needs to sit down with the economy minister and deliver a more a coherent economic response 
I suspect the Minister's answer will be shorter than the member's question. Okay. Minister. Uh, well, can I say, firstly, I, I don't accept that. I, I, I operate on a can-do process. And, uh, uh, of course, if we, we should, of course, have the ambition to have a properly set out budget and programme for government properly consulted on and properly debated and delivered by this institution. In relation to the economic uh, plan, it's not, it's not the responsibility of two departments. I mean, the Department for Infrastructure, for instance, has a huge role uh, in economic development. Uh, the Department for Communities has a significant role in terms of town centre regeneration. So it's not simply a matter of two ministers getting together and knocking their heads together and coming up with a grand plan for the executive and the assembly. This is an executive wide responsibility uh, and I'm certainly looking forward to discussions that I have with the individual departments but then collectively at the executive in terms of our budget process. Mr John Blair. Speaker, in addition to the question already asked, can I ask the Minister uh, if, if he can, in the interest of future planning processes, provide an update on the prospects of multi-year budgets starting in 2021? Well, as I have been saying, that, that we've, I put that question directly to the Chief Secretary of the Treasury about a fortnight ago, and he said they were still operating on that basis, which did not entirely fill me with confidence, uh, because we want certainty in relation to that, and that is the questions that we continue to pursue with the Treasury, as I say, not just here, Scotland and Wales are also pursuing the same questions, and they are in the same bind that we are in terms of, of getting their budget processes going, getting that constitution going, understanding the funding envelope and understanding the time frame attached to it. Mr Jerry Kelly. The Procurement Board is responsible for setting pol uh, policy priorities for procurement expenditure, which influence around 25 per cent of the Executive's budget. I believe that this is important to ensure that these policies are developed uh, by experts in public procurement along with representatives from key sectors in the economy. I have asked the Executive to agree a reconstituted procurement board and the appointment of representatives from key sectors of the economy to work with procurement professionals to develop future policy. It is important to ensure that procurement policy is informed by experts if it is to address the immediate priorities of the Executive in regard to economic growth, social value and fast delivery of infrastructure projects. Thank the Minister for his answer up to now. I am glad to hear the board is going to be set up. But how does the Minister intend to ensure that social value is at the heart of such procurement? I think that it's firstly I think the, the, the intention is in a reconstituted board, as I say, to have expertise on it. And to make sure that the policies that they bring forward and the advice they give, the policies are adopted by the executive. So social value is a key policy objective for myself and the department. Uh, and what we want to do is make sure that when those policies are agreed, that they don't just sit in a procurement board, but they actually filter down through all of the departments and the arms length bodies to make sure that they're effective. Uh, because with tendency, uh, I would think, in, in some of our public institutions to be overloaded with policies, but not much in the by way of implementation. So my idea in terms of reconstituting the board is to get proper expert, expert advice, to get executive approval for policies, and then follow through in each department and on the body to make, think, make sure things like social value are properly put in place in terms of procurement. Ms Sinead Bradley. Mr Principal Deputy Speaker, I appreciate the Minister's response so far and particularly as reference to bringing together that procurement board. But does the Minister accept that the procurement board must work as part of a much wider framework, and therefore would he further consider the appointment of a one-off fiscal economic commission to examine budgetary settings and structural challenges for the economy in the difficult times ahead? Well, I think you're correct in that procurement is one part of public spending, but it's one as I said, it's about 25 per cent of public spending, so it's very important. It's important that we, we have policies attached to that, so things like social value and, and, and more efficiency in terms of the spend are, are key, key things. But of course, uh, I am looking at the idea of a fiscal commission, a uh, fiscal council to assist then in overarching spending plans and the, the uh, levers that we have available to us in terms of revenue raising. Mr. Gordon Dunn. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Principal Speaker, and thank the Minister for his answers. Uh, as Minister, you will be aware of the concerns about unacceptable delays in opening of tender documents in, in relation to the, the public sector schemes. What have you done as Minister to try and progress that issue, please? 
Well, I mean, if there are specific issues that the member has, I, I would ask him to communicate with us and, and we can look into those specifics. Of course, we want procurement to be as efficient as possible uh, to make sure that, that the, that the uh, tenders on, on all of the issues that are, are done within the way in which departments are delivering them as quickly as possible. And during the pandemic, we did uh, send uh, a note around all departments to advise them to get ready construction projects to make sure they were at the point of tenders going out and delivery, uh, even when the construction industry was shut down during the earlier lockdown phase, to do that uh, and to get those uh, those issues ready so that all of the, if you like, the procedural side of things were done and construction could very quickly get back uh, up and running again. So we're always keen to improve uh, on efficiency and effectiveness. And if there are specific uh, issues that the, the members are aware of, then I would invite them to, to let us know about them and we will, we will deal with them. Thank you. The time for listed questions has passed. We now move to topical questions. I call Ms Paula Bradley. Mr Principal Deputy Speaker, um, Minister, you may or may not be aware we had Solace come in and brief the Committee for Communities two weeks ago. And while they were very complimentary of you and your Permanent Secretary as well of the good work that you have been doing in and around rates, they had mentioned to us as a committee the issue about marrying together the district rate and the regional rate. Um, just to ask you um, if that is a possibility or what your assessment that would be. Well, I, I think it's, it's very worthwhile uh, to do because particularly, for instance, the interventions that we were doing in relation to business support. If, uh, and in that, the Council's take from the, uh, the rates were, were protected in that, actually, and, and, and it was a good outcome for Councils. I'm not surprised that they're complimentary of the Department, whatever it would be, but uh, it was a good outcome because some of those businesses may have closed and the Councils would have lost the rate. Uh, we, we guaranteed the, the protection of their rate in that. But I think in terms of setting an overarching policy, I mean, if the Executive took an initiative to support businesses uh, and, and reduce the rates on them, but the council took an initiative to increase the rates, maybe an individual council or a number of councils, uh, it would undo one part of the policy, would undo the other. So I think the closer that there is between what regional government does and what local government does, then I, I think then we will have a better outcome and we will have more consistency in terms of approach. So I am very keen to work with local government through Solace and through the councils themselves, through uh, Nilga I have met uh, on occasions as well to discuss these things out and to try and get more uh, joined up working arrangement right across the public sector in that regard. I think it's to the benefit of everyone. Ms Bradley for a supplementary. Thank you again, Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker, and can I thank the Minister for his answer. Then, just following on from that, um, they also mentioned in their briefing um, to the committee. Um, I mean, we all know that the rates is based on the estimated penny product, and they had uh, mentioned about protecting um, that for them going forward because they're worried about clawback whenever the actual figure um, becomes a reality. Just again, your assessment on that. I know they have asked for that sort of two, three years long term, but even for the year ahead. Well, can I say as part of the rates process that I talked about earlier in terms of looking at what rates might be like next year and what reliefs can be provided, we also have the engagement going with the councils as well. Uh, so a lot of the, the more technical issues like the penny product and others we, we can, we can uh, undertake through engagement, but I'm committed to closer working with them. Uh, and clearly over the course of the pandemic, we did at various times find money to put through the Department of Communities into Council because we recognise how vital they are in terms of public services and support on the ground. So we want to make sure the Councils are in a position to deliver public services and continue to function to do the good work they're doing. So I, I think that level of collaboration and understanding on all of those issues is something we're keen to work on. Mr Framakan. I'll ask Kim Corlea, uh, can I ask the Minister uh, if he could confirm whether social enterprises and B&Bs are included and a support scheme for businesses subjected to restrictions? Yes, I'm glad to confirm. I, I had in a previous answer to Mr Alistair confirmed that in this scheme that we had developed, we, uh, just due to a conversation with the smaller bed and breakfasts, we were able to ascertain that uh, they could be verified mm -hmm. uh, in terms of the business they do through the tourist boards list. Uh, and we were able to include them. And yes, uh, social enterprises are, have also been included because uh, not only do they have a business side to their function, but they're hugely important in terms of delivering services on the ground and engaging uh, and employing people that perhaps otherwise wouldn't make their way onto the workforce. Uh, Minister, and uh, further to that, uh, could the Minister say has he, has he received any proposals in relation to financial support? for sole traders, taxi drivers and uh, the coaching, coaching industry? There are a range of, of sectors and, and a lot of them have been mentioned here today in the earlier debate uh, as well. 
that we have yet to receive proposals for, and, and some of that has been through you know, a, a difficulty in getting uh, individual departments to, to decide who is responsible. Uh, others, because it may be in terms of data, trying to find ways of verifying who, who are in these various sectors and who are, who are active economically. Uh, but I have encouraged all executive ministers who have a responsibility to urgently bring forward schemes to provide support. And I've made it clear that we're now on the second round in terms of some businesses in providing support, and that's all the more acute for those people who have yet to receive any support. Uh, and so I think it's, it's of vital importance that we get those schemes brought forward and delivered very quickly. Ms Clare Shogden. Uh, Principal Deputy Speaker, um, last month the uh, Northern Ireland Audit Office reported over £13 million of COVID business uh, related grants paid in error. Now, I appreciate those schemes were designed by the Department for the Economy, but as the Minister for the Public Purse, um, are you confident that that money can be clawed back that could be utilised in other areas? Well, the member will know that those schemes were developed. You know, probably in an unprecedented and unprecedented has almost become overused in this situation, but schemes were developed and put out on the ground because the, the, the primary importance in that was speed and getting support to businesses. And so uh, we did have discussions with the uh, controller and auditor general to advise them that we were taking risk with this. Having said that, uh, I, I recognise the amount I think that you have you've identified as, a, as a, an estimate uh, based on a number of samples that they have uh, worked it up, that that could be what it is. It's still in over 90%, I think it was 93, 94% has been, on that estimate has been paid out accurately which I think is remarkable given how quickly the schemes were put together and the money was paid out in the ground. I understand some money has been clawed back already, uh, and I would encourage where we do find that money was paid out in error to seek to get that money back, because, of course, as you say, it's important to get that spent in, in areas of places. Ms. Sogdo? Um, I, no, I appreciate the schemes were developed quite quickly and the aim was to get out money as quickly as possible. I suppose where there is frustration is that there are still so many businesses haven't, who haven't been able to avail of any monies and we have situations where some businesses have availed of more than what they were entitled to. So certainly I would encourage you that if that money does come back to the department and then back to, to your coffers that you will distribute that as quickly as possible and not just to those businesses who have already received but those who haven't received anything. Well, I... I uh, absolutely, but you will know that uh, I mean, it's not up to me to distribute that money. It has to be on the basis of a scheme that's brought forward by a department, in this case the Department of the Economy, to say we recognise that these people have missed out and here's a way uh, to, to uh, supply money to them. And, and uh, any conversation we've had with business, uh, and including in recent times when the, this further intervention has been brought forward by executive, has all been about getting cash quickly to businesses. That's what they tell us they require. Uh, and so, of course, we will try to do that as best we can. Some businesses were able to continue to trade uh, even over the course of the lockdown. Some businesses continued to trade. Uh, and so it was important to try and target that to make sure that we weren't giving money to people who were doing OK uh, and that they could continue to trade without very little uh, restriction. So it is important to try and find ways to target the support to where it's needed. And in doing that, sometimes people do miss out or fall through the cracks of various schemes. So uh, that's what I've asked ministers to bring forward propositions for that as urgently as possible. Mr. Pat Sheehan. Can the Minister advise why money allocated to health care staff to reimburse them for wages lost while they were on strike hasn't yet reached those staff members? Well, the Executive agreed to allocate £1.64 million to reimburse health care staff on the 18th of May. And it is disappointing that five months on, the Department of Health has yet to provide this money to health staff. Uh, I again urge the Health Minister to reimburse health workers who are at the forefront of the COVID pandemic as a matter of urgency, and this was something that has been agreed by the executive, uh, and so I'm not sure what the, the hold up in relation to payment is. Mr. Sheehan. Thank the Minister for his answer. Uh, could I ask the Minister, the uh, hospices provide a vital service in society here, but their funding has been badly impacted as a result of COVID. Can the Minister say if any uh, extra funding is going to be provided to hospices in the time ahead? Well, in May, I announced uh, £6.75 million pound support for the hospices, and uh, I had an opportunity at that time to visit uh, some of them, see firsthand the incredible work that they do. Uh, I'm currently working on a further support package for the hospices, which I hope to bring uh, in the near future to the executive. Uh, we have been engaging with the hospices, uh, including uh, Daisy Lodge, which is the children's uh, support 
uh, project and the Children's Fund for Cancer. Uh, and, and we hope to bring a proposition to the executive in the very near future in relation to that. There's also the outstanding issue because getting emergency support to the hospices at this time is one thing, but there is the outstanding issue of funding for the hospices being mainstreamed and that 50-50 funding which had been agreed with the Department of Health some time back uh, to make sure that that is honoured. And I know there is ongoing dialogue with the Department of Health and the hospices and I hope that you know, we, we don't end up in a situation where we're continuously trying to find emergency funding for these very, very worthy uh, projects uh, that we get them onto a more mainstream way of funding and, and so we remove that uncertainty for them in terms of how they can carry out their services. Mr Robin Newton. Mr Principal, Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his answers uh, so far. Minister, can I ra raise with you um, those businesses that are uh, engaged in the supply chain to particularly the hairdressing sector and indeed the hospitality sector, where they provide either direct goods or indeed provide services. And the closure uh, of, of the, those uh, areas has had a knock-on effect to them. Uh, bring in mind one small company who normally employ, employs 16 people. And because of the closure of hospitality, they're down to five people. Can I ask the minister if he's prepared to consider uh, support for those suppliers of goods and services to the particular two sectors I've mentioned? Well, I think the short answer is yes. Uh, of course, uh, the, the recognition in developing the schemes that we did very quickly was to get the support to people who were obliged to close under the new regulations. But there's also a recognition in our discussions at the executive that people who weren't necessarily obliged to close uh, but would feel a very adverse uh, economic impact from the closure of businesses who they, the primary function was to supply those businesses. So, uh, I have, uh, as I say, the, the Minister for the Economy is looking at a range of issues, including, I think, the, the people who are forced to close who cannot be got through the rate space scheme, if you like, but also uh, people in the supply chain. Uh, and I would hope that uh, some schemes or some propositions in relation to that would be brought forward to the executive very quickly. I accept that it is not the Minister's responsibility, uh, although he has indicated that it would happen very quickly. Can I ask the Minister then if he will give favourable consideration to supporting the suppliers of goods and services to those particular sectors? Again, yes, I give favourable consideration, but I make a recommendation to the Executive, so ultimately it's the Executive who has to approve. Uh, but I, I, I can only make a recommendation based on a scheme that is brought to me, uh, and I'm, I'm encouraging all responsible ministers to bring forward schemes very quickly because we have a, a limited uh, pot of money and it would help us not only to know what we need but also to get that money out quickly because the COVID related money that we received has to be spent in this financial year uh, and so it's important to get that money uh, if, if it's due to businesses that need that support to get it out on the ground very quickly and allow it to be spent. Mr Jerry Carroll. Has the minister had any discussions with the health minister uh, about rolling out a scheme that would provide free reusable masks to the general public in order to help deal with the, the pandemic and the worrying rising cases? No, uh, the Health Minister hasn't approached me in relation to any such scheme, nor have I received any such proposal. Uh, I know there are various considerations uh, in relation to supporting the community generally in terms of, of dealing with the pandemic, but that scheme has never been put forward to me, I have to say. Mr. Carroll. Thank you. Thank you, Minister, for his uh, uh, answer. It's worrying that he hasn't received uh, any uh, proposals. If he was to receive a proposal from the Health Minister, I know it's hypothetical, but would he look favourably upon it and be minded to support the rollout of such a scheme to tackle the uh, pandemic? Well, I think undoubtedly the wearing of face coverings is hugely important. Uh, I mean, it's been identified as one of the three key elements that the community can, can actively engage in the sanitisation face coverings and social distancing uh, and I mean there has been investment in terms of providing sanitisation you know in the high street and shops and support given to schools to do that so uh, yeah I think clearly if there was an issue in terms of people being able to afford uh, to have uh, face coverings and, uh, and a proposition was put forward I'm sure given the executives uh, I suppose central uh, desire to promote that very strong message, then I'm sure there would be considerable support of the executive for it. Mr. Jim Allister. Tomorrow is the anniversary of the brutal murder of Paul Quinn. Could the minister find it within himself 
to publicly and unequivocally acknowledge that Paul Quinn was not a criminal and thereby bring some relief to his still grieving parents. Well, I don't consider this to be part of the finance brief, but nonetheless, I have made uh, a number of statements in relation to that, and I reiterate and stand over those statements. Mr. Alistair. The Minister has never acknowledged that Paul Quinn was not a criminal. He knows that is what is required to unlock this matter. Why can he not find it within himself? He holds a position of great authority. Why can he not offer that to an ordinary family in South Armagh to acknowledge that their son was not a criminal? Well, as I repeat again, I made a number of statements in relation to it. Uh, I stand over those statements and my offer to meet and discuss these issues with the family remains. Thank you, members. That concludes questions to the Minister for Finance. If I could ask members to take their ease for a few moments to allow a change at the top table, we will return to the debate and the discussion on the supply.